It's tempting to think of a read-only list as the opposite of a mutable list. But in terms of the type hierarchy, that's actually not the case at all. A mutable list is actually a subtype of a read-only list. So if we were to follow the common rudimentary guidance for object-oriented design, for example, we might even say that a mutable list is a read-only list because inheritance implies an is a relationship. And this is important because if we create a function that accepts a regular read-only list, we might make the assumption that its contents won't change, but that's not guaranteed. In fact, it's not even implied. So let's change up our code here. And to demonstrate what I'm talking about, we're gonna, we're gonna pass in this list of books to this print list function. And I'm going to add some code here to do a check on the list and we'll say if the list is a mutable list then we got the smart cast here and we'll remove the element from it the thing is it can be really surprising just how often a list is actually a mutable list so let's run this code for example and we might expect that this line here will not run because you wouldn't expect this to be a mutable list now so we get this unsupported operation exception which is not really something that I think most developers would expect. And this brings along an even bigger problem. So according to this object's type, it says here that it's mutable. But at runtime, we discovered that we can't actually mutate it. And that means now we've got this disconnect between the declared type of this object, which is mutable list, and the actual semantics of the object, which is that we get a runtime exception if we try to mutate it. And this is exactly what happens when we disregard the Liskov substitution principle. A anytime you find yourself reaching for an unsupported operation exception where you've got a subtype that adheres to the interface of its supertype but doesn't actually provide any implementation for it like that, uh, anytime that you find yourself reaching for that exception, try to find any other way that you can to deal with the design challenge that you're facing and really only use this kind of exception as a very last resort. Another uh, problem that I mentioned earlier is the concurrent modification exception. And this one happens uh, when part of our code is changing a list that another part of our code is iterating over and they're running concurrently. In this one, I've got a few coroutines where one is going to print out the, the book titles here, and then we've got a second coroutine that's going to try to modify it by adding a new element to it. So let's give this a run and we end up with a concurrent modification exception there. And so the reason for that is we've got this yield here. So after it prints the very first one, it uh, yields, and the second coroutine runs and adds something to it. And then when it gets back to printing that second item, it notices that the list has changed. And so we get that concurrent modification exception. So if we need to guarantee that a list won't be modified, sometimes what we end up doing is we will create a copy of the contents to make sure that no other code is going to be able to affect it. So for example, we can do this by creating a new array list and passing in the contents from the first list. And then instead of looping over the original list, we uh, loop over the copy of it. With this change, we can run it and now it succeeds because nobody modified that copy. Uh, they modified the original only. And sometimes we call this defensive programming where we're going out of our way in this function to ensure that all the other code is going to play nicely with this function. So even though from the standpoint of the interfaces, it would make sense for a mutable list to be a subtype of list because mutable list does everything that a list does, plus it adds functions for modifying the list. It also means that an instance of a regular old list isn't necessarily read-only. The list type itself makes no guarantees as to whether its contents can be changed. And so if what we want is a list that is truly immutable, what we need is a new subtype. We would need another subtype of list that sits alongside mutable list and represents a list that explicitly cannot be changed. This is where the kotlinx.collections.immutable library comes in. Now this library is still in alpha, but it's been baking a long time. I mean, I mean a long time. I think its commit history dates back to like 2016, and I think its current incarnation has probably been around for a good three to four years at this point. This library gives us a new extension function. I just uh, updated the code here. You can see I've got this two immutable list on the end here. And as you can guess, this is gonna take any other kind of a list and convert it to an immutable list. And the type, as you can probably guess, is just called a mutable list, also has a type parameter. And now there's no way to cast this books to read to a mutable list. So when this code runs down here with this conditional, 
it's not going to succeed and the code inside that block is just not going to run at all. So let's give this a run just to make sure I'm not completely crazy. There we go. Great. And you can even see we did a, a mutable list of over here just to uh, emphasize that you can convert a mutable list to an immu immutable list like that. So uh, to immutable list is also great for those cases where we otherwise would have defensively created a copy of the list like we did earlier. So let me update our code here again. And um, what I've done here is I've got the coroutines again, but instead of doing a new array list and passing in the old contents, we're just doing dot two immutable list here. So we're still working on the copy, but we just did two immutable lists instead. I'll give this a run and just demonstrate that this works as we expect. Yep, everything succeeds. And for what it's worth, this two immutable list function will only create a copy of the list if it's not already immutable. So if it is already immutable, then we'll get the exact same instance back here. So here I'm uh, converting it to an immutable list before we pass it in. Then I'm also doing uh, two immutable lists here, and then we're comparing the instances here. Note that I'm using the three equal signs. That's comparing the instances, not the uh, the values. So let's give that a run. And you see we get true back because copy and list are the exact same instance. Okay, now immutable list itself is just an interface that extends the list interface. It doesn't add any new functions or properties to the list type. And since it's an interface, it's not actually a concrete type. So let's dig a little bit deeper. So below the immutable list on the type hierarchy is a is another interface named persistent list. So when we call dot two immutable list, we actually end up with a persistent list. And unlike immutable list, persistent list actually adds a bunch of other functions. These all probably look pretty familiar to you. So you can see we've got add, uh, remove, clear, and all of those are up here in mutable list as well. So what is the difference between them? Well, even though their function names and arguments look the same as their counterparts in the mutable list, you can see that each of these in the persistent list return a persistent list themselves. And so this actually sounds pretty familiar because it's a lot like the regular read only list when you might add them to each other, kind of the same approach where you're going to need to assign it to a new list variable. So if we call add on a mutable list, the elements going to be added to that exact instance. But if we call add on a persistent list, that original instance is going to remain unchanged and instead a new persistent list gets returned. So we can cast an immutable list to a persistent list and uh, add an element, and we assign the result to a new object. Now, if we're planning to work with persistent list objects, we can just use the persistent list of function up here instead. So we just change this to, instead of uh, list of, we'll do persistent list of here. And then we don't need to do the check anymore. Like I said, in some ways, it sounds kind of familiar. It sounds a lot like getting, uh, when we get back a new list, sounds a lot like using the uh, extension functions on a regular list like plus or the, um, the regular plus op uh, operator or the plus function either way. But even though they sound familiar, there's actually a very big difference in their implementation. So if we call plus on a regular list, we end up creating a new array list and we put all the elements from that uh, last collection into that, and then we also add a new element. On the other hand, if we call add on a persistent list, the returned list can actually just refer to some of the same underlying data that the original list was using. And this wouldn't be possible if the original list could be mutated. But since we know for a fact that it won't change, it's completely safe to do this. Uh, so a pretty neat way that by sticking with immutable lists, we actually get some kind of neat implementation options that wouldn't be there otherwise. Now, for those cases where we need to perform multiple modifications, a persistent list also provides something called a builder type. And the neat thing about the builder is that it extends the mutable list type. So here you can see I'm using it. I'm just calling dot builder here. And then we get to add and remove. You can see we're not assigning the results on these. We're just adding it directly to it. And then when we're done with all of those updates that we're making, we can just call build. And then that's the thing that gets assigned to the new variable. Because this is conforming to the mutable list interface, it gives us some flexibility to interact with, uh, with other code that's expecting a mutable interface.
So for example, let's create a new function down here that takes a mutable list. And inside this function, we will do our adding and removing. And then here we can just pass in the builder. So we're not passing in books to read, we're passing in the builder because that's the thing that conforms to that interface. And then when we get the result, we can still call build. So if your code is using a persistent list and you need to call a function that accepts a mutable list, maybe from a library or something, you can just pass the builder to that function and get the result back that way. Now, if you don't need compatibility with the mutable list interface so much, but you just wanna make multiple changes to a persistent list, you can use a function called mutate. And here's what that looks like. So it works a lot like the other collection builders that you've seen, like build list, for example. We just call mutate on the persistent list and make our changes inside the block and then assign the result to a new variable. One difference with the regular collection builders is that, so the regular collection builders will operate on the receiver parameter. So you could just do add and remove, or you could do this dot add and this dot remove, or you just say add and remove. But this one actually operates on the Lambda parameter. Uh, so we got to use it or give it a name. So I'm not quite sure the reason for doing that. I tend to prefer the consistency with the others um, if we could operate on the receiver, but maybe there is a reason for that one uh, that I am overlooking. So um, immutable collections are great for cases where you need to guarantee that a collection's data is never going to change. And we only looked at the uh, list today, but immutable collections library also includes implementations for sets and for maps. So if you find yourself working on a project that could use not just read only, but truly immutable collections, uh, especially in a code base that defensively creates a lot of copies of collections, give this library a look and see if it might meet your needs. <laughs>